Welcome to the interview series that sheds light on healthcare professionals and athletes' perspectives on the physical therapy industry as well as rehab in general. Um, today, I'd like to introduce Sarah Park, a model, bodybuilder, <laughs> powerlifter, marathon runner, uh, fitness coach, as well as a bassist. Tell me about yourself, Sarah. Damn. I feel like everything that you just said, I don't live up to any of those titles. I'm just like... They're all fake. Yeah, they're all fake. I've never done a marathon. <laughs> um, I'm like barely a powerlifter. Um, yeah, I guess like, well, I don't know. I, I thought about this before I got on. I was like, well, I think some big accomplishments have been like, I've squatted like 495 pounds like in the past. I think still to this day, I think... I mean, obviously you got like kids like squatting like 700 pounds, like no problem on Instagram, but I still think like 495 is like a big milestone for, for me. Um, substantial. Yeah. I mean, I know David, you got, you hit that too. So I, mean, I never hit it actually. I, I hit just like 480. Yeah. Ah. Dude, I tried 490. I couldn't get it. So, I mean, you're formally stronger in the squat. Ugh. I'm serious. Ugh. I mean, I, I, that was the number I was trying to get at least and I couldn't do it. And you pulled like 600, right? Yeah, I got that though. Hell so yeah. I'm happy about that. I've never done that. Um, but yeah, tell, tell us how uh, your training has progressed or changed since COVID hit. Or, I mean, even before that, like how did, yeah. how did your training change um, once you kind of got out of that fitness mindset? And then now that COVID hit and you can't go to the gym, what are you doing? Yeah, it's a good question. Like, before COVID, I, I like to say like several years ago, um, I've always like went to the gym, um, always like did like bro lifting, bro science, like just crazy, like circuit training and like burnouts. But uh, in college, I started working at Barbell Brigade and I started working out with like Bart and through that, we just kind of met some of the strongest and smartest people in the world. And so we just quickly started adopting the things that they were doing. Yeah, And so for, I want to say for like four years straight, I was just like squatting, benching, deadlifting and doing all of the like bodybuilding accessories for like four years straight um, while tracking macros. And after I had left barbell, I still trained, but nowhere near as intense as that. Um, and funny enough, like right before COVID hit, I kind of had like this crazy epiphany that like, man, like I used to train so hard. Uh, but now that I'm training more alone, I kind of felt like I'm just really sandbagging it and just cruising like my training. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think for like four months, I just really started like kicking it back up and going really ham in the gym, just really cleaned up my diet too. But then when COVID hit during March, it just all went <laughs> just down. Cause for obviously sure. like, like, I don't know, like, I don't want to say that it's, um, I'm not motivated, but it's pretty rough to do like a backpack row for like 50 reps for like one set. Yeah, dude. And then think and think that it doesn't do anything. And so, long story short, uh, I definitely just was pretty inactive for like a full month. And then um, after I moved down to Orange County, I kind of told myself that like I need to be training for something. I, I think I've always thrived in my life when you know I'm so like on a regiment and on a schedule and so I just started running like once I got to Orange County and that's just the only thing I've been doing since then. Before we get into your running lifestyle how would you say you started the lifting journey? Why did you start and yeah when did you formally stop? Yeah was that before um, COVID or was it because of COVID? That's a good question. Okay. So I think a lot of guys can relate. Like I started lifting cause I just wanted to get at girls. I just wanted to like, look good. Um, like feel good. And funny enough, like, I think even when I was like shredded and had like a six pack, I think I realized that the only people that notice are my guy friends, exactly. which is the complete, yeah. It was just like, so like, Oh, that's pretty stupid. Um, it reminds me of playing guitar. Like I, the first time I played guitar was to impress girls. And then over time you kind of get over that and then you just get like super into it. 
Yeah, I think that's why I think too, like, because I, I still coach and I don't think there's any shallow reason for anything that you do. I think as long as you can get your foot in the door and start a process, I think that's great. And how many like clients do you have currently? And how many clients did you have before? And would you say at, because your exercises, I mean, your regimen has changed? Do you, do you change how you coach people? That's a good question. So when I was coaching full time, I had like up to like 60 online clients. And then after I got married, I, I just really wanted something stable. And um, I don't know, this is like a whole nother story, but I feel like I think I was pretty young when I just went full on coaching. Um, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's, I'm like naive or I'm just really passionate. Like it was really hard for me to sell a program when I can tell the person won't be a good fit for the, for my program, mm -hmm. but also like balancing like, Oh, well I got to pay for my bills. And yeah. I think just ultimately, like, I think, I don't know if it's because I was young, but I just felt like even if I was like selling a program to someone, I know that they're not going to stick with it, but they're yes. still willing to pay. Yeah. And it just felt not that it felt wrong, but it just didn't sit right with me. And I think cause I started coaching cause I was passionate about it. I just couldn't shake off the fact that, Hey, I'm just taking this guy's money and they're not going to achieve their goals. And I had other like entrepreneurs or just other coaches in my life that are just kind of like, Hey, that's on them. Um, but it just never that, sat right with me. I think you're a very ethical person and uh, I mean, money isn't everything to you, even if it does pay your bills. I can relate in that when I treat someone, yeah. if I know that they're not very cerebral or, you know, they're just kind of a complainer and they blame other people for their problems, I almost feel like I'm just wasting my time with them. It almost feels wrong because they're not living up to their full potential. Like, I feel like I could be helping them a lot more than I am because of you know, their, their limited mindset. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've always talked about this. I think people refer to like coaches or um, PTs or even like doctors as kind of like a one-stop shop that's going to change their life. But in reality, it's, you have to go 150% like, like of your own effort. And then a coach can help you take it to the next level. A I agree. You can take it to the next level. But I think that's, I mean, it's funny enough, like I'm sure it would have came up in any of these other questions. I think that's what I kind of learned, like just through training and um, just living life, like nothing is given to you. There are no handouts for um, rehabbing an injury or coming back from an injury or being able to squat 495 pounds. I'm sure there's like 1% of people that, yeah, like it's just easy for them. But for the majority of people, like you really need to grind and work um, to see improvements. Do you think a general outline can help the masses or does it have to be specific? Well, I guess this is in the context of like, I think there are general programs that exist, but I think when people start applying that or start doing it, they have to understand that it's really not catered towards them. And they have to understand that it was made for everybody. So like, for example, if I created a program to help people lose weight or whatever, or like build muscle, what if in my program it says to squat and someone has knee issues, right? Then it's like, yeah. um, you shouldn't squat. It's a roadblock. Or, yeah. Or if I wrote, Hey, like you need to train four times a week, but for some reason, like whoever the person is, they just can't dedicate four times a week to the gym. And so I've always talked about like template programs that I think it's a good frame of reference. Um, but you also have to understand that like these programs don't know like your work schedule, family life, um, how many hours of sleep you're getting. Uh, if you're on a caloric deficit surplus or you eat like shit. So like, even for me, like I've quit, like, again, I'm not on like this crazy running program. I've just kind of seen a few free like marathon um, prep programs. And I just kind of understood that, okay, it looks like they're increasing volume each week. And the biggest thing that they're focusing on is like one day a week that they're increasing the mileage there so that you can actually prep for like your marathon. And so for example, this workout 
has like one day you'll run like 12 miles and then like the three other days you'll run like three miles or like four miles i can't believe you're doing that shit man like <laughs> literally like three weeks ago sarah was telling me that he had run like three or four miles in a day and it, i mean like two or three weeks later he was running 10 miles so this this guy knows a thing or two about dedication in regards to selling programs would you say you've moved towards the coaching model because it's more personal and you get to uh, keep tabs on whoever you're coaching and it's more of like a subscription service yeah i feel think like you can better better coach someone that way as opposed to here just take this hand out get better yeah i think it's probably the same with like pt right like there is no like one size fits all like method right like if 10 people come to you with like shoulder pain you could probably write something general like oh hey like try these stretches but there are so many different factors in each person's life and this is just kind of my i mean it's like just kind of what i've realized uh, with coaching you really have to keep in mind like a is your client going to adhere to your instructions and i'm always all about like making the first steps with the client like super easy like easy wins like hey just start working out hey just start tracking your food hey like stop drinking soda nothing like super intense and i think maybe like one out of like 300 people that i've worked with has done like literally everything that i've said like to the t and that is like robotic but that's not the world and i think that's totally okay and so I like doing like more of an individual approach and more one-on-one -on -one because we get to explore their life together. And I can just give like a unbiased kind of like a third party view of like, Hey, I think we should try this or that, which obviously like a PDF program can't do for a person. In the therapy world, I would say it's a similar ratio. And mm. when you get those people who want to listen to everything you say, it's a lot more fulfilling. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm like at the edge of my, my seat trying to help someone who really wants the help. But if, if the person is passive and really doesn't believe he or she can get better, I mean, you set like a mental block to begin with and it just, it makes my job not as fun. And I yeah. would say because of the majority of the people like that, it kind of, excuse my perspective of physical therapy at times mm. um in regards to pt and rehab what is your impression of that obviously with just training in general and lifting i think even minor injuries it's inevitable it's like all part of that process and i kind of view like injuries as like an indication of like you can be doing better in these areas for example like i think um i told you like maybe about two years ago or a year ago, like my squat really started like getting really back to where it was before in the past. And then I just started getting like knee pains at the bottom of the hole. And for me, I had never experienced that in my life. That's right. So I forgot I, about that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I remember, um, it's has that completely funny, like, resolved? Well, I mean, I haven't squatted in such a long time, but yeah, yeah. like, after, like, so, um, going along that journey, I remember, um, I sent you videos of my squat and you were just being honest and you're like, yeah, I think your squat form can improve. And so for me, I was kind of taking it back. Cause I was like, damn, like I'm a coach. I've been squatting for like a few years now. And David is just pretty much saying my squat form sucks. And that's, that could be attributing to like my, my uh, knee pain. And um, granted enough, I, I did what you recommended. I stopped squatting for about like six weeks. I remember, I was just doing like random, like really light machines. I really started practicing and breaking down my squat form again, like forming from or uh, filming from the side, just to make sure that like I'm I'm coming down like evenly down too. Um, I don't think again, your, like, your squat form was horrible. I, I think if you just tweaked it slightly to take the emphasis off your knees and, and yeah, bias your hips yeah. a little more, I mean, then you could, I mean, that makes a world of a, of a difference, but I don't think the foundation was horrible. Yeah, yeah, I remember that's exactly what you said. And I was like, okay, like, and I think 
Yeah, like that's exactly what I did. And once I started squatting again, like it didn't hurt at all. Um, reoccurring pains that I do get though is um, I always kind of like, I don't, know the, I don't know what the right term is, but I always pull my neck or kind of like crank it. And yeah. so doing what? Maybe, yeah. So like uh, about a year ago, back to back weeks, um, I was like shoulder pressing. And then the week after that, I was doing like an incline uh, dumbbell press on bench and I pulled my neck. Dude, like, yeah, the same thing back. happened to me. The yeah. same thing happened to me, and I uh, had a disc bulge in the left side of my neck, and my whole left arm, I, I couldn't use it. I couldn't do a single push-up. I mean, it was a, the disc was impinging on upon a nerve root, and it yeah. was just my entire function. My left side was was messed up. Did it affect did you your arm after? at all? Um, I just rehabbed myself. Just did some spinal mobility exercises, and I mean, over time, it got better. Um, mm. And I don't have the numbness, tingling, or anything anymore. Mm. Um, and I recently got a MRI myelogram of my spine, and then the the disc bulge isn't there anymore. But it was pretty oh, large. That's good. Yeah. Tell me more about yours. Oh, okay. So, my I I definitely didn't have anything like that, like a bulge or anything. Um, I just remember like after I pulled it the second time, I just because I was in the Orange County, so I called my friend Danny, uh, who's at High Five Hand Therapy. So I called him and I was like, yo, like, I just need some sort of like treatment right now. And I, I think I just wasn't thinking because I was almost like just responding and kind of like reacting to the pain. And so when I get there, like, um, not that Danny didn't have like a sense of urgency, but he's just like, oh yeah, dude, like sit down. And he started doing like grassing on my neck. And I really appreciate Danny because um, he was like, yo, like this is not going to solve like your neck pain. Yeah. by any means he's like i'm just like temporarily like relieving it but he was like really being going above and beyond and explaining to me he's like hey like i think you should really look at um how you exercise how you sleep how you text um how you work and w once he started saying all these questions i realized dude like my neck is always in like a fucked up position like when i'm sleeping um, when I'm driving, like I was driving like 70 miles a day, like, and I started realizing I'm always cranking my neck like this the entire ride. Yeah. Um, just even like when I drive like that and even when I work, cause, um, at, at my job, like I'd always just like hunch, like, like hunch over like this and work with my shoulders, like just really raised. And it's been a year and a half now and I've literally had, had no like neck pain or like Real. neck issues. Would just you say because, that, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Would you say uh, that it, it's just one side that typically flares up or is it both sides or in the middle? I think it was um, one side that, that kept doing that. And it hasn't happened since? No, it hasn't. If it, if I, it happens again, I'm here for you, bro. Yeah, I mean- I, it, for, I would be, I'd be down to work with you, honestly, to get your, yeah. your I mean, your, your marathon uh, more <laughs> optimal. I'm serious. Yeah. It's kind of like a, I mean, I didn't realize this about myself. I had a hip issue that was causing uh, a pelvic rotation, which was causing my spine to side bend. And then my mm. neck was side bending in, in an abnormal manner. And I mean, that's what set me up for that injury. I mean, mm. I needed like a catalyst in that bench press, taking it off the incline, kinking my neck the wrong way. I don't uh. think that was the main factor. It was a catalyst. like. It, my body was messed up from the start and that just, I was vulnerable and then that's what happened. So I was, I'm wondering if, I mean, maybe you had an issue like that. Yeah, probably. Like, I think I didn't realize, and it's funny too, anyone that's listening, like I always text you any question. I'm like, Hey, uh, the side of my back is hurting here. Like, what should I do? And David always like, you always go like super in depth with what stretches I should do when I'm sitting, standing, whatever. And so, I, know, I love that about I, I you. You're always you're always trying to learn, and I I, I think there's reciprocation. Like I, I always ask you for you know life advice, <laughs> advice with relationships. So I mean, it's, I know nothing. I know nothing. Equal and opposite. Um, for sure. Yeah. So in regards to rehab, what what is your view of 
uh, the physical therapy industry, like, um, like the new companies that are coming out on Instagram, they're super trendy, um, versus like the, the older clinics that just have the, you know, the outpatient model where it's like a mill and they just try to get as many patients as yeah. possible. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, like I don't work like in, in the PT realm and I think the closest that I've been is that like I coach and I manage a gym and my friends are PTs and they just kind of tell me like the struggles and just kind of like the reality of the industry. Um, but from what I've seen and what I feel is that like at the end of the day, like every PT company clinic or whatever, like it's a business, right? Like they, they need capital to survive. Um, and also I think, just the way that humans are programmed is it's kind of fucked up, but like we truly believe like if I buy this, then I'm going to get this result. And like we've mentioned before, I feel like nothing in life is really like that. I think it's almost like believing if I bought these Nikes, I'm going to be able to dunk. You know what I mean? Like you're only going to be able to dunk if you train to dunk, right? Yeah. Like, I think so. And, and that's why, like, I, I don't necessarily blame any industry because at the end of the day, dude, like they're just trying to hustle too. Um, and sometimes, and, and what's crazy is that sometimes it's not like PT clinics or these companies are saying that like, Hey, if you just work with us, your life's going to get better. It's just, that's just what people assume. Mm -hmm. And so I think PT and like rehab and all of that is, necessary like like dude like our bodies go through so much um like damage just as, as we're training like for something or just even just working or even just holding kids whatever it is like we need that help um i think it's just like as a consumer you have to understand that a like how do i make this sustainable for myself and like financially and how do i how can I always like keep learning so that I don't need like an external um, program or product or service to keep my body like, okay. I don't know if that answers the question. No, I agree. That was a great answer. I think I didn't buy into the whole physical therapy idea until about two years in as a therapist, which is very mm -hmm. late. And mm -hmm. I mean, I was going through PT school, not even really believing in it. I mean, I, I, I like anatomy, neurology, physiology. So it was very entertaining and I wanted to get a stable job and not until two years down the line is when I, I really, you know, immersed myself in seeing results and I started mm. to buy into the actual process. But in the beginning when I didn't really know much and I thought I knew a lot, that's when I thought that, you know, this PT thing is kind of bogus. Like, anyone could give someone stretches, you know what? Yeah. I mean, I, what am I doing? I'm just giving people stretches for a living. Like that, that's, yeah. that's bullshit. But if you yeah. take a step back and think about like creating stability or creating more mobility in a certain area, it, it can really make an impact on, on one's life. And as a young person, you don't really have many issues. So it's hard to really visualize improvement until, you know, you, get injured yourself and then rehab your way out of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny you say that. Cause um, like, I don't know a single person that's like pro PT that hasn't been injured. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like, it's not like uh, a healthy person is like, Oh dude, like it's all about PT and like stretching foam rolling. Yeah. It's like, no, like it's unfortunate that everyone has to go through some sort of pain to yeah. see the value in it, right? Like, it just sucks how that works. Um, right. And I think in any discipline, I mean, in any industry, there's going to be fraudulent people. And in the PT world, it's so easy to get away with making money and giving someone bogus stretches or exercises that it's done a lot. And you, you can really manipulate the layperson and they'll still pay for your services. Um, so, I mean, I think that in itself makes it seem like PT is bogus to some people. And yeah. it, it, I think 
if you go to the right person, which I did when I changed jobs, like my employer now, he's amazing. And he's taught me so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've incorporated a lot of his skills into my treatment plans. I mean, you could really see like the difference in, in one's life. Like, like me, I know I, I run baby miles, like I run one mile at a time, but I mean, yeah. just changing my foundation, like my, my weight bearing posture and standing has really made my running form more efficient and uh, I can better maintain form like throughout. And it doesn't feel like a drag the entire time. I think like, I think another example is like, like hiring a personal trainer, right? Like anyone that's like in the fitness industry, they're just kind of like, why would I hire a personal trainer? Uh, but I do believe, I'm sure there are amazing personal trainers out there, right? Where they're able to motivate their clients. They're able to jam pack information like in their sessions. And ultimately that might lead to a client becoming like self-sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're able to train on their own. They're able to keep learning. They're able to like, um, yeah, keep growing from that. I'm sure PT is the same. Like, if you are working with a PT that can teach you, that can um, help you self-identify where these issues might be stemming from. And obviously like not every person can do that because I'm not a PT. I'm not going to be able to like self-diagnose, but if your paid service can get you to the next level and be sustainable, then that's an absolutely great service. But the reality is the way that people are, I mean, it's kind of messed up, but, most people aren't like proactive. Most people are passive and they just want everything given to them. And so I can, I can see why you're saying when you switch um, clinics, you've seen a total different side of PT and how it's improving your patient's life, how it's improving your own life. But yeah. I like how your services include both macro coaching and you know, powerlifting, bodybuilding style coaching. And it's not just one specificity. Like you're using Roy to help you with the powerlifting side. Is it still that way? And I mean, are, are you st still coaching a lot or is it, uh, are you backing off a little bit? Yeah. Um, there are still some clients that Roy and I work on together. Um, and also I've completely scaled back a lot with coaching and I guess this is like at least very personal to me in that like I only want to help people that I want to help and it sounds really fucked up um, but I think just my genuine belief with like training and I'm sure for PT too it's because now I'm not fully dependent on for this to make money like if you're going to pay me it's not my job to motivate you. Like I am not going to fucking tell you to go exercise. And I think it's funny enough, like a lot of the people that I work with now for online coaching, they are my friends. Like they, I, they want to pay me. And I tell them, look, like you can get me a gift or you can buy me food later, but I just want you to succeed because I, I know that you have the motivation and the drive. And at the end of the day, when a client is motivated, it's really not work for me. All we're doing is just catching up and talking and keeping tabs. And so um, I do have people that still ask like, hey, like, do you still coach? Like, hey, like, I'm more than happy to pay. Um, but for me, I think, A, again, like we talked about it, like I just don't feel good taking someone's money if they're not motivated. Yeah, like, and like too, like I don't, I, I just don't think, so again, like you and I have been exercising since we were like, 14 years old probably or like 13 years old right um no one has put a gun to our head to go to the gym no one has forced us to go exercise um but that's what people want and i'm just like dude like that's not sustainable like um i ultimately want to teach and for people to understand that the drive has to come from you ultimately you every day like to go exercise to give it your all um so at the end of the day, like when I work with majority of these clients, they have never tried on their own to like do like a program or never held themselves accountable. So like, why would I, 
Like, why would I, like, I already know, like, it's going to go south. You know what I mean? Like, so it just doesn't feel good to take money from that. It's very interesting how you want a client who's self-sufficient, even though most people who seek help aren't. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I think those clients who are self-sufficient and do seek help are self-aware and they realize that they have stuff to learn and those Mm -hmm. people are going to succeed. Um, Let's say you had like a hundred clients and you, you love them all. And uh, I mean, you were getting paid very well. Would you quit your current job to pursue coaching? Um, And then I know you have another side hustle doing photography. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, essentially what is your dream job money aside? Dude, that's a good question. Um, It sounds so weird, but I think my dream job would be coaching. Right. It's, it's, it's so, um, cause I mean, again, like I get pumped when I, when I get to see like someone, like, I think for me, I'm sure PT is the same. Like, I mean, I have, I have success stories of clients and I don't know if my client will ever listen to this, but his name's Ivan. He's from, um, from Georgia. We started working together two years ago. Like this guy has lost 60 pounds in two years. Holy shit. And, um, what was the starting weight? I think like 240, bro. Like 240. That's and great. It's great like, when you can see the quantitative improvement. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, like major things that I can see from that is just this guy's like level of confidence, just like increasing in his life, but also the way that he feels. Um, also, like he's kind of told me that um he's kind of like been like after like losing all this weight uh, he's also been able to get out of like a toxic relationship and now he's like dating someone that he's like super happy with um i think for me like those are like major major wins and i think it's just it's almost like a drug not that i've done a ton of drugs or anything like that but i get this high from like like talking to someone that doesn't believe in themselves but they double down they grind and then they really see like the results that they've like made, you know? Um, I think that's a true passion of mine. But again, I think when it comes to like relying on that for money, it gets really weird. I think it's dope how there's spillover from the fitness realm into your personal life. For sure. Like, like for me, I mean, I would say a lot of traits that motivate me to work out help me in my life are there any yeah. traits what are three traits that uh are very refined from exercise and coaching people that have carried over into your daily life yeah um you know it's very interesting the first thing that comes up to me is uh you mentioned that like so my third side hustle is like i take um photos and I, I recently, oh, it's been about like a full year now that like I said that I'm going to make money like shooting weddings. And I think for me, like for only doing that for a year, uh, I feel like I've really built a good network of like other photographers or just like people in SoCal like know who I am. And they're just more shocked that I've only been doing this for a year. And so what I really attribute that to is like, A, I don't feel like I am a naturally gifted person in lifting, in running, or even in photography. I just don't have an eye or I just don't have like that natural beast mode strength. Um, But really what lifting and like even just tracking macros has taught me is that if you can dedicate like just like a few hours to something every single day and don't look at the results like on a weekly basis, but just really just cash out like on a, on a yearly basis, you can really see how much like you're getting better. And so when I said that I'm going to start shooting weddings, um, I only did one wedding. Like it was like, really like, I think I I can only assume for people, they're just thinking like, damn, this guy like has big balls. Like he's going to be a wedding photographer now after only doing one. But for me, I'm just so wired that like, okay, if I want to get better photos every day, I need to take photos. 
or every day I need to do something photography related. Um, and essentially that like, I'm creating my own like workout program for like photography. Right. And it's kind of that same mentality. Like I'm sure for you to squat 485 pounds, it's not like you were checking every day. If you can squat 485, you just put your head down and you just start grinding, just start like working out. And I feel like photography is the same way, dude. Like I have to take so many shitty photos to like get one good photo and to not like beat myself up. And again, I'm not like this superhuman. I still have like days where I'm like, Oh, oh like, will I ever be, like amazing or will I ever be like the best? Um, what would you say gives, also, you, gives you the confidence to believe in yourself like that? Like you, even though you can't see results immediately, like how do you, how do you know there's a light? How do you know that you're going to be the best version? How do you know you're going to be successful? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, man, it's so crazy. I think about this all the time. I think about, you know, how do I stay on track when I have a goal in mind? And it's just looking at other segments in my life where I did succeed. And like, what did that look like for me? So um, even like when COVID hit and all, obviously all these weddings got like canceled and um, I was getting a lot of inquiries for weddings, but obviously it went out the, the door. For me, I just felt like, dude, this is just temporary. And I just need to put my head down and grind. And like, for example, when I first got shredded, I went from like 209 to like 180 over oh, like- When were you shredded? Never. Um, that was back in 2014. That's when I first experienced that. But I remember I have, dude, it was crazy. You're cut out. But again, like it's, it, it, it was, it's the same feeling of like, and this is something that I tell to like my friends and not like, cause I feel like people will misunderstand me, but when I have new clients or when I have like, just when I'm talking to friends about anything, like if you're expecting like pro results, then you have to double down and put every fucking thing mm -hmm. like in your, like in your willpower that you can to get those things. Like, I think people are so, I don't know, like, I don't know what the right word is, but like, we just expect that we're going to become an expert at something, but that's not the reality. Like you, you really have to grind for it. And so to answer your question, I think in my photography life, I think I really treat it like training. I just, I don't, I don't have, I try not to keep it emotional. I just try to keep it very black, uh, I guess, very objective. I just take photos. If it looks bad, it's bad. If it looks good, it looks great. And I just try to keep uh, rinse and repeat. Um, I think you and I talk about like this too. Like I think money, like the way that you manage your money is the same way. Like I think being on a macro diet or like caloric deficit, which is like a budget has helped me understand, oh shoot, money is the same thing. It's hilarious. And yeah. Again, I'm not like a finance expert or anything like that. Um, but it, through my wife, who's a, an amazing saver, she kind of made me realize that like people are always looking for hacks to like not get fat. But the reality is, is eat less and work out more. And money is the same, like make more money and spend less money. Do you have any current pain? And do you believe that it's fixable? I have a lot of heart pain. My heart's broken. <laughs> no, um, like no, even I, even the yeah. smallest amount, like even if it's a small ache, it's it doesn't have to be a sharp pain. Just a small chronic ache that you feel on a daily basis, and you just think, oh, it's just life. I'm getting older. This will never go away. It's not a big deal. Uh, oh, actually, yes. So I pull my lower back way more often than I have ever in my life. Like, for example, um, like this is my fault, but when I start taking photos, I don't stretch at all. Cause usually what it looks like is, Hey, we're going to meet at four. As soon as the clients come, I'm just like on the go, like ready. But then after the shoot, I realized, Oh my God, like I, I pulled my back and because I was in the zone, 
I did not realize my back was like pulled. So I just kept going. And so that happens pretty often, like really, really often. And so I know exactly what pose you're talking about. Like I can picture it in my head just when you were shooting Sarah. Oh yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you some stretches to do for that one. I'm down, bro. I need it. So like now the last shoot that I did, I, I made sure I stretched funny nice. enough. And has it helped? Yeah, for sure. I think cause, um, I think funny enough, like I bought a standing desk, um, before I started running, but now that I run so much, my legs are too tired. And for me, the way that I see yeah. it is like, I want to, I want to conserve all my energy. So I sit, but now that I'm sitting more, I feel like I'm just, um, adding so much pressure to like my hips my glutes, my lower back. And so I really have to take the time to stretch before I shoot. And so the last time that I did, I was like totally loosened up and I was like ready to be like in weird positions, you know? Would you say running has increased your pain at all? Not in your upper back, but just any, any region of your, of your body? Uh, funny enough, I, I do think, um, again, like I don't know what I look like when I run, but I started to feel I, I remember I texted you like I still have like really I, I I do feel tightness like in my scapula um but again I don't know if that's directly from running or if the way that I run is adding like or like putting my body in a specific position to start getting my back really tight mm-hmm. um I yeah, definitely I mean it could be a form of your thoracic spine too just because yeah. you are in that position a lot I mean I, th- I think we neglect the fact that your, your T-spine is uh, adjacent to your scapula. So if that foundation is poor, I mean, it's hard for your scapula to move. Yeah, like I just, I just roll out both. And I, as soon as I do it, I feel like I can really like breathe better. Like my, yeah. my neck feels better. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, your, your ribs attach to your thoracic spine and mm. it, you can't expand your ribs if your, your thoracic spine is, is flexed. So that makes sense. Yeah, and, and again, I forget like, so when I run, I have to roll out every day. And that's just so that I can feel better to run the next day. It's not even like, I'm not, I don't, I feel like I'm not doing preventative work. I'm just doing maintenance work just to like keep up. And so. Have you noticed any differences as you've, you've increased the mileage, like in you, in how you feel, or does your body feel like it could take it? And it's, it's just immediately used to the new stimulus. Um, Funny enough, like, I think because I have been so proactive with like stretching and just rolling out, um, my body is adapting like better to the longer runs. But also when I increase my longer runs, I decrease um, volume like throughout the week. So like I myself am adjusting my runs so that my body can handle it. And it's not like a huge like um, shocker. So like if I increase my mileage on a run, like a specific day, I just make sure that the overall volume is either the same as last week um, or a little bit lower if I'm feeling like way too fatigued. Wow. That's a good idea. So let's say one week you do, you know, six, five mile days and the next week you want to try 10, would it be like three, 10 mile days, something like that? Uh, I guess more like the example that I'm following is I've done like 24 miles total in a week and how I split that up was it was pretty poor but I did like four days of six miles but obviously my end goal is to do a marathon so I realized I need to maximize like my runs and so I started making that one day a long day so I started adding eight miles to that day 10 miles to that day 11 miles to that day and then the, the rest of the week I kind of like lower it so that at the end of the week uh, it's still the same volume or just a little bit higher than the week before. Got it. And even with running, I'm starting to realize like, Oh, I, I need deloads too. And so how do you juggle running and lifting? Like, are you still doing any body weight stuff or quarantine workouts? Um, just like push ups, curls. Um, and like, I I've been trying to go to the park to do like, a hundred pull-ups or something like that, at least like once a week. Wow. That's still pretty good. Yeah. Do you do those nowhere, on your light yeah. days? Yeah. Like, uh, I try not to run on the weekends. Um, so I just try to do those on the weekends. 
And then how do you make time for your, for your wife? Oh, we need another episode for that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> like, so I actually encourage my wife to run. So like, usually if I do a long run or any run, I, I tell her like, Hey, I'm outside. And so she comes out. And so I like cool down as she runs. So right. that, that's been working for us. I remember you were telling me how you, you run like 23 miles and then she runs the last two with you. <laughs> so on your 25th mile, she's done with oh, you. Oh yeah, right. You know, actually I'm going to try a half marathon on Monday. Really? By yourself? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you think you'll do? Like when you ran 10 miles the other day, did you feel like you had more in the tank? Yeah, I felt more thirsty than tired. So that was like a good sign for me. What do you think your, your max mileage is right now? I mean, you can go as slow as you want. How many miles do you think you can run? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I know you have, I know you have a call, but uh, funny enough, my brother's done a marathon in college. And Get so, yeah. Out of all yes. people. Yes. Damn. So my brother's been like coaching me a lot. And so, cause my brother had a college roommate who was like a track, like star, like beast. Like he walked onto like the UCLA, like track team. Um, my brother's college roommate. So, um, funny enough, like my brother had like a really shitty prep leading up to his marathon. So the longest that my brother has ever ran before he did a marathon was like 10 miles. And then he, he completed a marathon, but he, overall volume wise, he was running enough. So he just broke down like seven miles, like, I don't know, like five times a week or six times a week or something like that, which but is still a lot for a runner. 10 miles. I mean, casual 10 miles is, that's really good. Yeah, he, he trained up for it, but listening to my brother, um, cause the longest he had ever ran was like 10 miles and then, but he did, he had the work capacity and then the longest he had ever run was at the halfway point at a marathon. And he's like, Oh my God, like I need to run that again. And so I can't imagine being halfway done and having that feeling. I wonder if it's like after you're halfway done, it's like, you get runner's high and the, the next half is just whatever. I mean, I have no idea because, I mean, the most I've run is two miles. So, I mean, I think too, like anyone that's listening, and I'm sure you'll agree, David, like I think how I run and how I do most things in my life is the thing with life, though, is like you never know when you're at the halfway point. Like, even when you're up for a promotion or like maybe when you're in PT school, you can gauge like okay i'm at the halfway point of my program um but i think especially when i run and when i do like anything in my life i really try to not think about okay hey like we're halfway there i just always just try to like kind of like close my eyes and just look at it like day by day and with running it's really like i just try to make games in my head like okay like i just need to make it to like this corner and then after this corner it's gonna be really easy like i'm, I'm almost like lying to myself but in a sense, I'm distracting myself and not really focusing on where I'm at. I just try to keep going. I love that about you. I feel like that trait is apparent in so many of your habits. And that's why you have such good habits. Whereas people can, you know, go down the rabbit hole and just make these bad habits snowball and then they turn into addiction, et cetera. But I mean, mm. you're a very clean person. You don't do drugs. I mean... You drink once in a while. <laughs> You're not really a slave to anything. And I, I think that's really cool. That, that requires a lot of self-discipline. Thanks, man. You too. I feel like that's why we get along. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, I, I think it's a good time to close. Do you have anything you want to plug to anyone or uh, and maybe talk about your photography and coaching services, how much you charge? Nah, I just want to say... If you want some good tacos, check out Soul on Six. <laughs> Best tacos in LA. I would say that for a fact. Dude, um, yesterday, uh, I mean, when we did it, uh, there was a like a photo shoot. Not a photo shoot. They they had this huge camera, and they're making a documentary on the LA Clippers, and they want us in it, which is really shut cool. up. Yeah, man. It, I mean, we're just nobodies, and they they want us in it. I think they just like our vibe. And like the graffiti on our sign and everything. The LA it, Clippers? Yeah, I think it, we just represent LA well. So that's yeah, so be on the sick. Lookout. Yeah. Um, Anyone that's listening to this, you need like those are the best tacos, I would say <laughs> for sure. I appreciate it, man. 
Um, if there, if you have any closing words, feel free to say them right now. Um, yeah, I think, I think the general theme that we hit today was, dude, if you want to accomplish something, it's never going to be given to you, but doubling down on your efforts will never hurt your progress or will never hurt your journey. Like there's nothing like, I can't think of a negative thing that would happen if you tried really hard to accomplish a goal. You know what I mean? Like, and that's yeah. the only way you'll see progress. It wouldn't be worth it if it were easy. Um, yeah. I yeah. appreciate your time, man. Uh, I owe you one. I really thank you for doing this. Uh, we'll have to hang out soon. I was talking to yeah, Rick man. today. He wants to do a little session on his rooftop. So let's, let's do that sometime. Dude, I'm down. I owe you one, man. Really appreciate it. All right, dude. It. I'll see you later. Talk to you soon. Peace.